Murphy, and he moved to the University of Chicago as a postdoc and uh, worked also in Atlas and started a new experiment, which he's going to talk about, about the axial and dark matter researches. And uh, more recently, he moved back to the UK and he's now a fellow at the uh, University of Cambridge, uh, still working on Atlas and on the RAD experiment. So this. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and the introduction. So today I want to highlight these uh, two pioneering letters and tell you the stories behind uh, the uh, publication of, of these results. And the first is colliding light to specifically measure the magnetic moment of an enigmatic particle called the tau lepton. And the second to propose this new axion dark matter experiment called BREAD that bridges uh, quantum technology with astroparticle physics. So I want to cast our minds back to the dawn of the scientific revolution when Herschel in 1781 discovered the planet Uranus. And this was the first planet to be discovered since the five known in antiquity. And what do you do when you make such a profound discovery? Do you just declare science is done and go on holiday? Of course not, right? You study its properties. You measure its motion as precisely as you can. And they did this for over six decades until people like Le Verrier started to notice that there was something peculiar with its orbit. And being a believer in classical Newtonian dynamics proposed a new planet to correct for this deviation and sent the coordinates to the Berlin Observatory and, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, it, it's... it's back. Okay, so he sent the coordinates to the Berlin Observatory and they pointed the telescope at the position and as the story goes, on the same night, discovered Neptune to within one degree of the prediction. So this was a spectacular triumph for the predictive power of classical physics. And people were excited because uh, they had also discovered a new tool for making further discoveries. That's precision measurement and precision calculation. <laughs> so they started scouring the data. Perhaps there are more anomalies in orbital dynamics. And soon they noticed Mercury's orbit was also off by 43 arc seconds per century. And so they proposed a new planet that was very close to the sun, so they couldn't have seen it in the glare. And they started searching. Maybe they could see the transit of this planet across the face of the sun. There were certainly some false alarms that they realized were just sunspots. And of course, we now know the happy ending to the story is this was the first evidence for a paradigm shift to general relativity. So discovering new planets, that brings fame and fortune to the 18th and 19th century astronomers. And even more recently in 2019, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for exoplanet discoveries. But discovering new planets, that ultimately left the known physical laws unchanged. And it was actually by studying a planet we had known about since classical civilization. That is actually what uh, revealed that space is not just a static background, but actually a dynamical entity that can be warped by matter and energy to cause gravitation. And today, we now use this very effect to reveal the existence of dark matter that is producing this beautiful uh, strong lensing picture of galactic light. And there is a beautiful parallel in particle physics described by the language of quantum field theory. It is also by measuring the uh, precession, and it is also by measuring the familiar. This is the first particle to be discovered, and the particle that enables me to project this picture into your eyes. The electron. Right? So the per mil measurement of the electron magnetic precession. That did not reveal any new particles, but it led to something even deeper and more profound. This paradigm shift that the vacuum is not a static and empty uh, entity, but actually it's, it is also dynamical. It is a teeming sea of particles and antiparticles bubbling in and out of the vacuum and spontaneously reannihilating re into these in these loop diagrams here. And today we now use these very effects to try and reveal the existence of dark matter that could be spontaneously created from the vacuum. And this is the hallmark of quantum field theory. So the lesson we take away from this uh, history is that precision measurements really do revolutionize science. And it is actually by studying the ordinary. That is actually what harbored some of the most extraordinary surprises. 
And so people in my field of particle physics are cautiously excited because we may be witnessing history repeat itself. There is now arguably persistent, widespread, indirect evidence for new physics. One class is called the lepton anomalies. There are some tensions between theory and experiment across a wide range of flavors in a wide range of laboratories. So you can see the electron and the muon G minus two, which I'll discuss a little bit more about, complemented by what we call these flavor anomalies on the top right. Now, an independent line of anomalies is in astrophysics. So dark matter is now established uh, unequivocally across a wide range of scales and crucially across wide ranging phenomena. Right? It is not just galaxy rotation curves, it's not just these beautiful lensing pictures, we also have galaxy clusters colliding, these bullet clusters, all the way out to cosmological scales, all indirect evidence that there must be new particles beyond the standard model awaiting discovery. So I want to focus the first part of my talk on the, the so-called G-2 uh, anomaly, which recaptured international attention just under two years ago. So here is just some screenshots of the New York Times, as well as on Nature, covering this anomaly when it was announced in, in April 2021. And this is this muon storage ring at Fermilab, where they trap these muons and watch it wobble in a magnetic field. They carefully measure this very precisely, and on the right-hand side, you can see that now famous plot in my field of this four and a bit sigma tension between the standard model prediction and these two independent measurements at Brookhaven and Fermilab. Of course, there is now some uh, uh, lattice calculations that land somewhere in between that uh, will have to be resolved. But this is not the first time that muons have surprised us. Indeed, even its discovery, who ordered that, is what Rabi quipped uh, in 1936. And today, we are now seeing the generalization of this surprise to, into a question of why are there heavier copies of matter? Right, so we are familiar with the electron, as well as the up and down quarks that make up the nuclei of atoms. And it's very interesting to draw this parallel between the standard model of particle physics, as well as 19th century, when Mendeleev was starting to arrange these chemical elements. And what they were doing back then is they were arranging these chemical elements by their mass and how they react. Right, so I highlighted here, this is the handwritten notes of Mendeleev back in 1890s. 1869, they hadn't even discovered the noble elements. Helium was discovered around this, this year here. And I'll highlight these alkali metals, right? So they, they arranged it by their mass numbers, um, and they also you know, observed what they looked like. They all looked a bit silvery, and we chucked them into water. They're very, very reactive, right? And we can also do something very similar in the standard model, right? We also group our particles by their mass. We now know there's a property called their spin, uh, as well as how they react, right? How they interact with other particles. So the quarks are very strongly interacting with things like the gluon, right? A bit like uh, alkali metals, they like to bind to, uh, the, the quarks like to bind to each other, just a bit like how the alkali metals like to bind with the halogen gases. And there are also some weakly interacting, weak, more weakly interacting particles down here, the leptons, uh, that only interact with these gauge boson particles, right? And the, the spin classification, right? We have all the spin half particles, the fermions, and then the bosons on the right, including this, uh, the spin zero and then spin one particles over here. So to understand the, the flavor issue more precisely, we want to study how they interact with each other. And G minus two is really a foundational test of quantum field theory, asking this very basic question of how does light interact with matter? So to go back to the basics, G is this proportionality constant in front of the spin magnetic coupling, the S dot B interaction that we all teach our undergraduates. Right? And Dirac predicted it to be two in 1928 in his uh, equation. And therefore G minus two are all the loop contributions. Right? So all the loops are all these particles and antiparticles popping in and out of the vacuum. So Schwinger revolutionized quantum electrodynamics by computing the one loop uh, quantity to be the fine structure constant divided by pi. This is the famous result that's engraved on his gravestone. And we're all very intrigued by perhaps the potential sensitivity to new particles beyond the standard model that we could be pulling out of the vacuum uh, 
momentarily, for example, the spin zero versions of leptons, uh, as well as dark matter particles predicted by theories that go by the name of supersymmetry. So the, the status of the electron and muon magnetic moments is that we have witnessed extraordinary precision. This is a true modern scientific triumph. The electron G minus two is now known to 13 decimal places and I, I defined here this A, the anomalous part, to be this G minus two divided by two. And actually this, this measurement was just published in, in PRL earlier this week. And the muon is measured to uh, about 10 decibel places. Uh, so th these are truly extraordinary, right? And this is where experiment and the prediction is competitive. But the elephant in the room is what about the tau, the heaviest of the lepton particles? And this is where we see some truly shocking experimental ignorance. The pressing problem is that this is barely measured. It is a 2004 result, just a couple of years ago when I started on this project, of minus 0.02 plus or minus 0.02. That is an order of magnitude away from even the leading theoretical prediction. And that's like saying my hand is one meter plus or minus one meter. Right? The 10 year olds I do outreach with can tell me that is a terrible measurement. But what's even more pressing is that we are not even testing the 70 year old one loop QED prediction that Schwinger made in 1948. And look at that, alpha over two pi, he got the first two significant figures correct 30 years before the tau lepton was even discovered. Right? And this is because the leading contribution to the G minus two is universal in the, it is independent of, of mass. There's no mass term here and there's no flavor dependence of this prediction. And just to summarize these three measurements of the G minus two onto one plot, right? So you can see the tau G minus two error bar down here. And for the electron, you'll notice I had to inflate the error bar by a factor of 10 to the nine, because if I didn't, it would be the width of an atom on this screen. But this is not just a pressing problem. This is an interesting open problem. A huge uncertainty in our measurements imply a huge room for new physics. And there is certainly no shortage of model building by our theory colleagues for these peculiar tensions that are, that are arising in the electron and muon G minus two. Here is just a, a lovely selection of papers uh, that I cite here. And I started my career doing these searches motivated by this G minus two anomaly. And these are the kind of plots that uh, we like to produce in, in Atlas. This is actually, I, I designed this plot over here, the dark matter mass versus the scalar lepton masses. And my PhD was this little thin orange sliver here, right? So that's what a PhD looks like uh, last decade. Now, in supersymmetry, this is very interesting because the G minus two contribution scales quadratically with the lepton mass. And because the tau is heavier than the muon, the tau can be over two orders of magnitude more sensitive to new physics than the muon. And unfortunately, at the time when I was just finishing off my PhD, I soon realized with one of my collaborators that there is no consensus of how to make progress in measuring the tau G minus two. There are various proposals to use future colliders. Some of these will never be built. Many of these will require future data sets. Uh, and th this was an open problem that is very interesting. So we had to think outside the box, right? So my collaborator, Lydia Beresford, was a postdoc at Oxford when I was there as a graduate student. And we came together after a, uh, a seminar on the G minus two, and we asked each other, well, why don't people talk about the tau G minus two? And so we, we wrote this creative theory paper, but crucially it had to overcome the status quo, right? So this, you can see, we tried to propose measuring the tau G minus two, but using LHC heavy ion collisions. Now the, the prejudice is that heavy ion collisions are very messy and you need lepton colliders, electron positron colliders to make high precision measurements. So how on earth can you try to measure the tau G minus two here? How on earth can it be interesting for precision physics with ESM? <laughs> And our paper really tried to open the doors uh, to, to overcome this status quo. And I'm very pleased to say that just a couple of years later, now L Lydia has moved on to DAISY, the German uh, national lab, uh, having won a one and a half million euro grant to, to work on this physics and uh, has started hiring postdocs and PhD students on this. So when we had a look at how was the existing world record measurement 
This is the diagram that we found in this paper by Delphi, one of the collaborations, the experimental collaborations at the predecessor of the LHC called the Large Electron Positron Collider at CERN. And so this diagram here, what you see is electrons, positrons, they emit these wiggly lines, the photons, and they collide, they fuse together to create this pair of tau leptons. And in total, they saw about 200,000 <coughs> events across all their runs. And so we were thinking, why not just do the easiest low-hanging fruit proposal and bring this process into the Large Hadron Collider? And when we had a little dig around the, the literature at the time, we realized this process had not even been observed at Hadron Colliders. Now, this is the diagram that we chose to have. And in particular, we chose these lead ions here because there is a factor of Z right, on this little blob here uh, and uh, as well as on the other side. And this represents a quantum amplitude. Right? Remember, in quantum mechanics, you square the amplitude to get a probability. And that's why there is a Z to the 4 scaling of this probability. And Z is the proton number, which is 82 for lead. And 82 to the power of 4 is 10 to the 7. So there's a huge enhancement in the probability of this process happening at the Large Hadron Collider. And we estimated about a million events could have been produced already a few years ago. Now, I've been going around in the past couple of years giving you know, seminars about this theory proposal, but I'm very pleased to be able to say today that it is not a theoretical fantasy anymore. It is experimental reality. Right? Not just one experimental collaboration, but both CMS that we, you work on at Brown here, as well as the Atlas collaboration, have been inspired by our, break, uh, by our proposal to realize this experimental breakthrough, both of these uh, PRL papers. So this is what usually comes to mind, these spectacular fireworks of thousands of particles saturating our detectors. This is the CMS detector, a beautiful picture of a heavy ion collision taken in November 2018. However, the kinds of collisions I want to talk about look a lot more like this, right? Just four particles detected in the CMS detector, breathtakingly clean, December 2015 also taking heavy ion collisions. The red line here is a muon that gets detected by the muon chambers, right? So CMS is the compact muon solenoid, very good at measuring muons. And the yellow lines here are what we call charged pions that come from the other tau decay. Right? So these are beautiful trident topology events. So what's going on here? Well, behind the scenes, you, what you usually see are these head-on collisions of particles at the Large Hadron Collider. Right? So you smash these particles little bits, and you create an exotic <laughs> state of matter called the quark-gluon plasma that our nuclear physics colleagues are very interested in. But what we proposed is that actually you can just let these lead ions fly past each other and they stay intact, unscathed, they don't break apart. And that's how you get these ex extraordinary clean events. And we can, and what you'll also see here are the electric fields that surround the lead ions. That is the source of our photons that collide to create new particles. We're using the Large Hadron Collider as a photon collider. And Atlas have made several breakthroughs in recent years, not just this new result. And the, one of the first ones is this so-called light-by-light scattering, right, where you can probe the photon self-interaction. Right? So remember, in, in undergrad, you learn that Maxwell's equations are linear, the superposition principle applies. So if you have two plane waves, they, as they pass each other, they superpose, and they go on their merry ways. But in quantum mechanics, you can induce this loop interaction that creates this self-interaction and the light can scatter. And you can also use these things to look, to look for resonant enhancement. Uh, there could be axion-like particles that could resonantly enhance this process. Now, a couple of years ago, I was also working on this measurement, trying to bring photon collider physics to the PP case, right? proton-proton collisions. So this is the pioneering forward proton scattering measurement I made. And we also observed the production of electroweak mass states by the fusion of two photons. And then this result is what I'll talk about in the next few slides. So to make this a bit more precise and quantitative, when you have any collider, you want to convert energy into mass, right? So here we have two photons that smash into each other, and there are, you can convert that energy into mass, right? So this is just equals mc squared. That's on the x-axis here, the mass of the two-photon system. And then on the y-axis is this luminosity, right? So how bright is your lead ion or your protons? 
So what you see here, two lines, the black one is the lead lead uh, scenario, and you can see the red line is the PP scenario. And what you also notice here is what's called this luminosity, right? So the beam, how intense the beam is, you can see there's a seven order of magnitude difference here that just happily uh, compensates the 10 to the seven enhancement of the cross-section that I mentioned earlier. Now, down here, I've also marked various thresholds, right? So if you can collide these two photons at a certain energy, you can pair create particle, convert the energy into the mass. So at the low masses, we can produce these light fermions, the electrons, muons, tau leptons start here. And at the heaviest scales, you, you can see how, because the black line, the lead case, drops off very quickly, we have to uniquely use the PP case if we want to probe very heavy particles at hundreds of <coughs> electron volts. OK, and to, you know, to, to really present to you the, the nitty gritty theory details, right? so we want to calculate this cross section, this probability, which is the square of the amplitude. And it, there are three components to this. right? So it's a, it's a lovely integral. This we can do with numerical integration through the Monte Carlo method, which is very standard in particle physics. And then we have these two other parts. right? The first part is the photon flux. So how often are these photons coming in? And this, it turns out, you can actually just look up in classical field theory of a relativistic moving charge. And this is indeed described by Jackson Electrodynamics, chapter 15, section 4. And uh, you can look up and you'll find this lovely formula here of the photon flux. There's a factor of z to the squared, the fine structure constant. x is the um, momentum fraction carried by the photons. And then there are these funny capital Ks. What on earth are these capital Ks? They are the modified Bessel functions of the second kind. Now, I certainly don't remember that in my special functions course, but the important fact is that they are implemented in Fortran 77. MagGraph is written in Fortran, and so as a graduate student, while my friends were playing with you know, machine learning and fancy Pythonic TensorFlow, all very pretty, there I was learning Fortran, trying to convert it from Fortran 77 to Fortran 90. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> what would the case of the case? Sorry? The case are Bessel functions? They are the modified Bessel functions. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. So the last part is this quantum mechanical process that we have to compute. And so what, what I had to do was I had to vary this g minus 2, right? So this is a little blob over here. This is where the new physics would come in. And uh, th this is using a, an approach called the effective field theory, right? So if you just want to see the mathematical Lagrangian, this is what it looks like, right? So if you're not familiar with this, don't worry about it. All, all you have to uh, remember is that the non-relativistic limit of this is S dot B, right? So the sigma mu nu is the relativistic Pauli matrices, right? It's really the, the commutator of the gamma matrices. And then this del A bit is the B, right? So then you have the S dot B. So this is what the amplitudes that we're trying to compute look like, and this is the result, right? So the cross-section as a function of the g minus 2 variations, you can see how at negative values, it actually decreases this cross-section before it shoots back up. And that's because at negative values, you have destructive quantum interference when this middle term here becomes negative. Right? So that's a, a kind of a nice little feature that we see. All right, so that's all very fun. What does this look like? Well, it, I was very, very pleased to see the CMS result when it came out last year because they actually used this uh, computational method uh, and it compares very, very well with the data that CMS measured. They used 2015 data. This is actually the first ever measurement of this process of lead ions uh, producing these tau lepton pairs by the collision of two photons. And uh, it's really pleasing to see this measurement because this is using a small bit of data and we're just getting started. It will only get better in the future. All right, so I'll cover the analysis I was working on uh, in the ATLAS experiment. So we also have this really beautiful Trident event display. Right? Again, the red line is the muon that comes off one of the tau leptons that decays into a muon. And the other one, you can see these three tracks are these three pions, right? so these up-down uh, quark uh, combinations. And the lovely feature about here is that the all charged particle tracks, so this is the tracking chamber of Atlas, above 100 mega electron volt in momenta are shown. And this little curly feature here is a very low momentum track down to 200 mega electron volts. And this actually doesn't even reach the outer parts of our detector called the calorimeters uh, because it's just bent away by our magnetic field. 
Now, the other nice features about this data set is that it, it only takes one month to double the, the data set. That is actually why, I, as a graduate student, I was interested in this, because at the time, I would have had to wait five or six years for the luminosity to double when using proton data. This so-called pileup, which, which is a measure of these additional hadronic interactions, is actually three orders of magnitude smaller in the lead ion case. That's why it's so clean. And these triggers that we have to use to tag these events to record to data, we can actually bring these thresholds right down to the detection threshold. So what you were seeing here is this middle uh, section, this middle column here, which is the one muon three tracks analysis that I proposed, right? So the muon comes here and the three pions down here. This is actually the middling statistics in the three different categories that I proposed. So we see about 85 events down here and about 10 background events. So pretty good signal to, to background ratio in, in this kind of physics. But there's actually one with higher statistics, the one muon one track here. So one of the tau's decays into just one track dominated by the pion decays. This is where we see uh, some five times greater or even six times greater statistics here, but at the cost that the background is actually also a bit higher. The cleanest channel is actually this muon plus electron. So this other one going to the electron. This is the cleanest one, but the statistics is also the lowest of the three categories. So here is one of the few plots where I'll have a, some data points over the prediction. And this is the this muon plus one track, right? So the left-hand side of this. And what you see in white is this signal, gamma, gamma to tau, tau. And the blue is the dominant background coming from <coughs> dime muons that are misidentified. Right? And you can see just how pure this signal is, a very, very clean uh, process. And this is what's plotted here is the muon transverse momentum. And as I was alluding to, we're going right down to the threshold of four giga electron volts. And this is pretty much how low in momentum we can detect in Atlas because muons, a fun fact that I learned in graduate school is that muons lose about three giga electron volts of energy before they even reach the outermost part of our detector because the calorimeter is, is in the way. So when you put all these ingredients together, this is the result, right? So we have the large electron positron collider results, the predecessor to the LHC and our results down here, right? By split by their categories and their combination. These are truly groundbreaking results because they are competitive with LEP. This is the first laboratory measurement of the tau G minus two in two decades, a bit like the electron and muon G minus two. And when I was talking to our nuclear physics colleagues, they also were looking at each other and wondering, is this the first time we had seen tau leptons in heavy ion collisions? And it turns out, yes. Right? And the final part is that you know, when we proposed this idea, people thought, right, have Lydia and Jesse gone crazy? Right, how can you make precision measurements in heavy ion collisions? You know, the backgrounds are too large, right? Well, I'm very pleased to say that, you know, no, we haven't gone crazy. We have just gone and measured a foundational observable to percent level precision. Okay, so here I want to take a little interlude and just reflect how the instrumentation progress is really what drove the success of what you just saw, right? And of course, you know, my predecessors, my, my advisor were, were, was building the actual detector uh, two decades ago. And I just want to reflect how in, in uh, you know, when you cast your mind to the dawn of the scientific revolution, right? People like Galileo and Hooke, they did not invent the telescope or microscope, but what they did is they upgraded it and they used it in new creative ways, right? So Galileo pointed it at Jupiter and discovered extra moons and people like Hook used it to open up the field of cellular biology. And of course, today, it is no different, right? So Newton invented the reflector telescope, and we are still sending exactly the same kind of design, just upgraded and out into space. And the Large Hadron Collider is really just a very fancy microscope, right? But of course, we, we know that with light, it hits the diffraction limit, and that constrains the size of the objects you can see. And that's why we have to use quantum mechanics the fact that particles act like a wave in order to probe inside the proton at the LHC. Now, when we discovered that light was also a wave, we could also build new instruments, right? Like the diffraction grating, the interferometer, that paved the way, right, with these, these Bormer lines, as well as the michelson morley experiment, to quantum mechanics and relativity. And of course, we're still <laughs> using these instruments, right, to make profound new discoveries of exoplanets, as well as gravitational waves. So instrumentation really is a driver of this kind of transformative science. And we are no exception at the Large Hadron Collider. We are preparing a major upgrade. 
And one of the cornerstones of this upgrade are new silicon cameras, right? And this will take ultra granular images for this uh, discovery science. And in Atlas, we're working on this, what's called the inner tracker, the ITK upgrade. And I'm specifically working on these so-called strip sensors, which Brown is also working on for CMS. And just to give you a sense of the upgrades we're doing, right? We're tripling the amount of silicon that we have, and we have a tenfold increase in the number of readout channels, right? And these are the kinds of collisions that we're expecting to take. This is a simulation, but these are the kind of pictures that we expect. <laughs> And just to give you a sense of the timeline where we are at, right? So the, these are these little silicon modules. They're about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And I joined this project around here in late 21. Today, we're over here in early 23. And we're in this so-called pre-production phase, which is this dress rehearsal before we actually create the real thing. And the integration will happen only in about five years time. That's when we will actually install this detector and by the time we start taking data with these detectors, today's undergrads will actually become postdocs. Right? So please keep teaching them quantum mechanics. <laughs> so here is an overview of what I lead in the Cambridge Clean Room. So the first steps that we do for this module production, right? so these sensors are part of these little cameras here, and we receive the sensors from Hamamatsu, our favorite Japanese company that creates these, and the hybrids and power boards from Birmingham and Berkeley. Right? So this is a truly international collaboration. So the first step is we have to mechanically couple these uh, circuit boards to the sensors. We glue them on. And then we do some metrology to check that we've glued them onto the right place. And then once we've mechanically coupled them together, we have to electrically couple them. And that's where we do some wire bonding. And then finally, we do both electrical as well as thermal stress testing of these sensors before we ship them out. Right? And what, what you'll uh, see here are these 2 by 14 modules on one of these mounted onto these staves and we have to create 11,000 of these modules for the barrel. And Cambridge is signed up to deliver uh, testing 3,000 of these sensors, the quality, quality control, and then building 1,000 of these modules plus 10% yield. And here is a lovely photo montage, just one slide on what I look like when I dress up as the scientist emoji up here, right, living the childhood dream. <laughs> So you can see up here, me and myself in this clean room gear, uh, preparing and then scooping up some glue before we spread it onto this stencil here. And so here's a zoomed in version of the glue. And this is the, the rear bit of the circuit board before we glue it on to the module itself. So here is myself doing some wire bonding. This is what the wire bonding machine looks like zoomed in. Uh, we're also taking some nice little breaks out here, having lunch and, and dinner. And then here I am doing uh, the electrical uh, testing in this setup here, right, plugging in little cables before we put it into this humidity bag uh, off uh, to ship out, right? And here is myself with one of the postdocs uh, also working on this. And here is my <coughs> PhD advisor who came to visit as well, which is really beautiful to see. Okay, and the, the message I want to send on this slide is that every innovative idea that we propose as young scientists strengthens the case for the uh, next generation. Right, so here is a nice little snow mass white paper about the opportunities for these kinds of new physics searches using heavy ions. Right? And one of the things that we uh, were very happy to see was CMS making these phase two projections. Right? You can see how the uncertainty, just very naively extrapolating to the high lumi LHC, the kinds of improvements we expect, as well as over here, right, this is the, the axion-like particle parameter space, right, this thing that can resonantly enhance photon self-coupling. And you can see the kinds of gains that we expect in the coupling versus mass parameter space. And the comment I want to make here is that before uh, we, uh, these results came out, there wasn't really much of a scientific case to keep running heavy ions at the high luminosity LHC. And it's actually thanks to uh, us exploring these uh, very precision measurements and novel searches that is actually what motivates this extra dark green bit one month per year running uh, into the next decade. All right, so I've now mentioned axial light particles. Let me tell you what they actually are and why they're interesting. So axial light particles, they're a new spin zero particle. It's a pseudoscalar. And they solve these two classes of problems, right? One is what we call the strong CP problem, uh, which uh, is, was solved by uh, or solved by Petre and uh, Quinn back in the 70s, and this is really the the problem of why the strong force seems to conserve this charge parity symmetry, and the implication of this is why the neutron does not have an electric dipole moment. 
Now, the second problem that the axion solves, which I've already alluded to, is the dark matter problem, right? And of course, this field was really kick-started uh, by uh, Vera Rubin and Ken Ford when they observed these rotation curves of the Andromeda galaxy were too high considering the measured luminous matter. And in terms of the search for dark matter, I think there are arguably two key lampposts which the community are searching under. One is the weak scale, which is where I did my uh, graduate work in. So I, I worked on the ATLAS experiment looking for dark matter particles predicted by a single symmetry. <laughs> of course, there's, we can directly detect potentially these weakly interacting particles because in the weak scale, they behave a lot like billiard balls, right? So they strike these uh, liquid noble uh, detectors and they create this, uh, these two scintillation signals. Now, the axion lamppost is very different. It's not like a billiard ball. It's a lot more like a wave, right? And so the analogy that you want to think about is that it's a lot like trying to listen to this axion dark matter radio, uh, and you're trying to tune the station to precisely the, the right frequency. So the flagship experiment for doing this is uh, the so-called axion dark matter experiment, ADMX, based out in Seattle, Washington. So here is the axion search landscape, and uh, this is the axion photon coupling as a function of the mass. Right? So I showed you this little plot up here. That's this top right-hand corner where we do these collider searches. This is this <laughs> resonant enhancement of the photon self-coupling. Now down here, this little white region, right? so all the colored regions are constrained by things like astrophysics as well as uh, other kinds of laboratory constraints. But this white space down here is where we could have viable axion dark matter. And what's interest interesting is that this uh, black line here indicates the region that is favored by the class of solutions that resolves this strong CP problem, why the, the neutron lacks an electric dipole. So the cornerstone uh, uh, current uh, experiments looking for these are these cavity experiments. This is these little uh, thin <laughs> lines down here. And these have two problems when you want to go to higher masses, which is this so-called terahertz gap. So the first problem is that when you're doing searches, you want to cast a wide net. You want to go as broadband as possible. But these experiments are narrowband. They rely on resonant frequencies. And therefore, it is very challenging to search over a wide parameter space. It's a bit like you're, you're tuning this radio station and you're having to sit on a specific channel frequency for a very long time to wait for the signal to noise to improve. Now, going to higher masses, uh, the, the scaling of the scan rate, right? So how long you have to spend on each frequency band scales very impractically, nearly to the inverse power of five. So doubling the mass, you have to wait 20 times as long. And so we need some creativity to overcome these two long-standing obstacles. And this is where my new experiment proposal comes in that I proposed while I was a postdoc at Chicago. It's called the Broadband Reflector Experiment for Axion Detection. And I'm very pleased to say that you know, this uh, proposal ended up on the cover of PRL. And when I told this good news to my collaborators here of this bread collaboration, they were happy, but also a little bit skeptical because they saw that it was on the 1st of April edition of PRL. But I can uh, very much reassure you, as well as my colleagues, that uh, this is certainly not a, a joke. So let's have a look at the physics behind this. So the first step is this fundamental physics, the Lagrangian term looks like this. This is the axion photon coupling. A is the axion coupling to the photon field, right? And this little squiggly thing just indicates it's an anti-symmetric coupling. And this is the Feynman diagram, right? It's an axion that interacts with the, the magnetic uh, field and turns into a photon. Now, the low energy limit in the laboratory, uh, the, it, 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 this actually manifests itself as an additional source current in the Ampere-Maxwell equation. Right, and the source current has this oscillatory behavior as a function of time whose frequency is proportional to the mass of the axion. Now, the consequence of this, uh, it turns out because of Faraday's law, right, we have this continuity requirement, all conducting surfaces will start spontaneously emitting photons in the presence of an external magnetic field. Right? And microscopically, what's happening is that the electrons inside your metal is jiggling in a very coherent way to start emitting uh, photons. Now, what shape do we want this conductor to be? Well, when we look at the cryostats that we want to put this in, as well as the magnetic uh, flux, uh, the magnets that we want to put them in, they're all cylindrical in geometry. So that was the natural geometry that we, we chose. And the crucial thing I want to highlight here is that this so-called dish antenna approach 
is does not require resonant tuning, unlike the ADMX experiment, to this unknown mass. It is truly a broadband conversion. Now, the next step we have to do is once we've converted the dark matter to photons, we want to collect all the photons. And so this is where we took inspiration from classical optics. They were having a very similar problem, but the inverse problem to us. What they had is they had point sources of light, a furnace, for example, and they were very interested in, in making lighthouses back then. And what they wanted is they wanted a co-parallel beam of cylindrically symmetric uh, light rays. And we have the inverse problem, right? So we have all these cylindrically symmetric rays coming in, and it turns out it's this parabolic mirror shape, a bit like a Hershey's kiss, uh, that, and you can see this ray tracing simulation, how these rays come in, and then they are focused onto a point. So just a shout out to these uh, few undergraduate summer students who uh, did a lot of the simulation work. And here is a sketch of what this might look like inside a cryogenic, uh, a, a cryostat, right, with multiple layers, with uh, you know, pointing out these pulse tube coolers, how we might inject calibration photons in, as well as the readout control. And this is where we would put a highly sensitive <laughs> photosensor. So that's the last step of uh, this experiment, which is to de de detect these photons. And here is one of the tables that I created in our uh, proposal paper. So the top two rows are what you can just buy off the shelf, commercial devices. So bolometers is just a fancy word for a uh, thermometer. And here what I've got is I've got the energy range of these detectors that they're uh, designed for, their operating temperature, and then there's NEP, right? So for the experts, you'll know this is noise equivalent power. But for the non-experts, this lower is better, right? So what you see here is the room temperature device. Uh, you can see uh, there is a six order of magnitude difference compared to the commercial cryogenic device. And then the last column is the sensor area. Now, down here, I've just highlighted the other kinds of technologies we have. So for those in astronomy and cosmology, they'll be very familiar with the transition edge sensors, kinetic inductance detectors. This is very established technology in that community. And down here are also these emerging technologies that we can use for what we call infrared photon counting, which is a very uh, a developing technology uh, that's uh, d based on these so-called quantum capacitance effects, as well as superconducting nanowires that can count these individual photons. Okay, so the proposal paper was really all about putting all of these ingredients together and then doing some projection sensitivity studies. So the vertical axis is this photon uh, coupling as, as a function of mass. So I've got the green band here, which is motivated uh, to solve the, the QCD strong CP problem. The blue things are the existing constraints. And then you can see our projected sensitivity um, is uh, for the different kinds of sensors. Uh, we, I've overlaid them here. So these technologies that we use in astronomy uh, and in the cosmology community, you can, see, you can see that with just 10 days of running, we in a 10 Tesla magnet, we can start probing new parameter space. And with these advanced photon counters, we can potentially do even better. And the, these dotted line, this assumes an improvement in the noise performance, and uh, this will require several years of R&D, uh, but it really sets the kind of roadmap for how we want to stage this experiment. Right? And down here is this lovely formula showing the scaling of the sensitivity onto the coupling as a function of the different parameters of our experiment. So to look into the, the further the future, right? So um, in, in our paper, we, we drew out this little staging approach, right, where you build a small prototype before you try and expand it uh, into a much larger experiment. And we also wrote this Snowmass white paper where inside you can see this lovely little drawing of what we might envision at Fermilab. So Fermilab is investing very heavily into this quantum science for doing astroparticle uh, physics. So we, we, so we were thinking that we would identify this magnet uh, at the University of Illinois in Chicago, that one of the PIs was retiring, they had this 9.4 Tesla magnet, and perhaps we could turn Fermilab into an Axion facility, right? So for example, uh, on one side, you could have, you could move the experiment from Seattle, Washington over to Fermilab when they upgrade to the next generation. And on the other side, you could just squeeze in our little bread experiment. And this is a highly complementary uh, scenario that we have here. 
Now, as a laboratory scientist, uh, I like to be in the lab. And uh, one of the first things that I did when I was at Chicago was start building a spectrometer to characterize the optics required for the experiment. So this started in January 2020. We had our parts delivered. This is what I look like when I hold a mallet and I start constructing a dark box. This is Kristen Doner. She was a graduate student who started at the same time as me, also hammering away, creating this dark box. Here we are uh, after a brief hiatus of a few months because of COVID. Uh, we were able to access our lab again to build the actual spectrometer. It's a Michelson design. You can see us taking this interference pattern, very, very lovely as, as we displace the mirror. And then we wrote this up in this journal of instrumentation paper. So this stuff is all funded by the Department of Energy, this uh, high energy physics quantum information science grant down here. Okay, so the other part of this hands-on work, another photo montage. Um, so at the end of uh, my postdoc, you know, everything was delayed by COVID. Um, you know, we started going out to Fermilab. So Fermilab actually reopened a lot more slowly compared to the campus of New Chicago. But eventually we got to see the, one of the clean rooms where they had this cryostat here. Now this cryostat is quite fancy. It has a little opening here that you can insert a window. And these are the superconducting photon counters that you can mount onto this little gold rectangle here. And then because this is a window, you can shine calibration light into it. And these are some of the first clicks that we saw a couple of years ago. So on, the, uh, on campus, we also have Gabe Hoshino. He's a new graduate student at UChicago in this radio frequency isolation room. And we are also starting to do some metrology on our reflector to check that it is uh, a good um, design to within specification. Here's Andrew Sonnenschein, one of the lead PIs of this bread proposal, finding, uh, you know, doing some magnet scouting here at Argonne. And our first in-person collaboration meeting was actually only last summer. Uh, after many months of uh, virtual meetings. Now, as a climate physicist, I was really drawn into this project because I thought it was just fascinating seeing this interdisciplinary work um, that really bridges not just particle physics, but also the astronomy as well as the quantum technology community. And one of our collaborators was at NASA, uh, Goddard, and he was interested in this kind of quantum technology, these very highly sensitive photon detectors for extremely different science motivations, right? So as particle physicists, we're interested in dark, discovering dark matter and resolving the strong CP problem. But the astronomers are building these devices because they're interested in solving things like how galaxies form, could be, uh, you know, what, what makes a planet habitable for life, and maybe even searching for <coughs> biosignatures. And I think to echo the snow mass process, you know, think outside the box, make connections to other fields, and even across the ocean, the European strategy is compelling us to strengthen the synergies between particle and astroparticle physics. So on this note, I think I just want to you know, give you a little bit of my vision of what I'm really excited about right now, which is, which is making these connections between fields right, of, of astrophysics and particle physics. And one of the ways I'm thinking about doing that right now is to uh, enrich and strengthen our cosmic ray science at colliders. Right, so cosmic rays are some of the highest energy particles we know exist in the universe. They could be coming from supernovae remnants, maybe dark matter annihilation, and perhaps being accelerated by extragalactic black holes. And I think the Large Hadron Collider is really also a laboratory for understanding these ultra high energy cosmic rays that strike the atmosphere and create these showers in the air. And next year, I'm very excited because the LHC is going to inject oxygen ions into the accelerator to really mimic this uh, interaction happening up here. Now the muons punch through the 90 meters of rock overburden and uh, we can use the atlas detector to detect these muons and what does this look like? Well I started looking at some of the data that most people just discard and found this extraordinary event where we can potentially use atlas not just as a microscope inspecting the microcosm but also as a telescope, an observatory for PEV cosmic particles, right? So this is an event display I found. This was in August 2016, um, when I had just moved out to CERN. And you can see nine co-parallel tracks gracefully traversing the muon chambers, unlike anything we usually see in these radial collisions of collider events. And I think this really striking science motivates creativity using these non-standard data sets. And this is an event display I made public just three months ago. So I want to tie everything I showed you together by telling you another story from the history of science. Right? And this is the neutron magnetic moment. It's one of my favorite stories in the history of science because it's when nature simply laughed in our 1930s faces. 
So when Chadwick discovered the neutron back in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, just actually down the road from where I live, the Dirac equation had just been written down in 1928, and the expectation is that the neutron is neutral and point-like. Why would it have a magnetic moment? Surely you are wasting your time trying to measure one. But the experimentalists went off and measured it anyway, and nature had a surprise. Let's make it large, and just to laugh in these silly human faces, I'm going to make it negative as well. Right, so this defied completely confounded expectation. People did not believe the measurements for many years. And of course, we now know the happy ending to this story is that this was the first indirect evidence for a new confining force, the strong nuclear force, nuclear substructure, quarks, and gluons. And the most elegant and beautiful part about this story is that people were just studying this esoteric domain of the natural sciences for its own sake. People could have easily asked, what relevance does this have to my everyday life, 15 orders of magnitude smaller than myself? Well, today we now use this very effect of nuclear magnetic moments to save lives with MRI medical imaging. But nature has the last laugh. The very solution to the neutron magnetic moment, quantum chromodynamics, the strong force, in itself has a new problem with the electric dipole moment that I've alluded to. The strong CP violation, it, because of that, the expectation is that this should be large. And there's a beautiful symmetry to these two stories. The, the reality is actually now zero uh, to better than parts per billion. And the solution could potentially be new physics, once again, perhaps axions. And so these two papers that I've illustrated to you and the stories that I've told you, I think really compel us to keep looking at nature in ways we have never done before, even if, and as the story of the neutron teaches us, especially if it completely defies expectation. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Jensen, for this exciting talk. So we have time for questions, please. Rick. With uh, the axion searches, you talked about obviously the difficulties associated with the scaling as we go to the higher masses. Um, do, will the technology work at smaller masses um, uh, and work even faster in terms of uh, I didn't quite understand what the limitations were in terms of the, the mass range over which, uh, over which. So, you, okay, so you have to use kid technology to get to the lower masses that the, the, the nano wires are not, are not capable of getting down there. Is that, that's the, um, and that is because. Yeah, so, so currently these nano wires are uh, only, uh, they've only been tested down to these. Um, you know, about 0.2 electron volts, um, because these are threshold counters. They actually have a threshold of about you know, 0.1 EV, and they count photons above that threshold. So there is some work that uh, our colleagues are interested in moving that and down. And operating what temperature? So th these, are, th th these are at uh, extremely low temperatures. So, um, mi uh, yeah, 0.3 Kelvin. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and at that temperature, they, they, they have an intrinsic threshold, you're saying, of a, a, a tenth of a EV or something? Yeah. Yeah, so that's an intrinsic property of the material, I believe. Right. OK. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Other questions? Ulrich. Like, uh, could you go to, I think it was page 23. Uh, there's 27, sorry. Mm hmm yeah, so there is this mu e measurement. The two black lines. Is there a double? A, is there are there two solutions or? Is yeah, that a yeah. mistake. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, yeah. the, this is a, a this is a key. Uh, this often happens when you do these kind of effective field theories, where um, because the likely because of the cross section there was destructive interference. Um, so, yeah, but, but because of this non-symmetric feature in the cross section, and we're also doing a differential fit as well, so that when you have little excesses uh, that might occur uh, in the differential spectrum, you might be more sensitive to different parts of this uh, cross-section shape. Right? And um, I think in the backup, I have a picture of the likelihood. Um, do I have a likelihood? 
somewhere. Yeah. So you can see there's this kind of double dip yeah. structure, and um, this is the combined one. But if you split it by channels, that's why you would get this double dip structure. But this is very commonly occurring in any effective field theory. So, but then does this mean your error bars were not 68% confidence level? They, 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 well, that, they are, um, but... Then why do you have that second thingy there? So, so, the, so the reason why is because, because of this double dip structure. So, so for the, 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 the mu e case, right, this bump here, right, would have... That, so, so what you would have had is that this bump here would have been... A, oh, okay, this is not the same. Right, so, so this, this is not, not the same, this is the combined one, but for the mu e, there's a... I, I don't have the likelihood for yeah, that, yeah. but no, that bump will be yeah. lower as well. Other questions? Sure. Um, there was a second theory of prediction uh, you said for the lead lead um, uh, uh, iron measurement. D Dinval, was it? Oh, uh, uh, as well as your own, which, which produced the result. There we go. Yes. What was that about? Sorry, did, in, in comparison to your own prediction for the. Uh, yeah, so, so I think... The cross-section. And is its disagreement in any way interesting? I mean, how, how different are the two theories? I... Your theories and that. I, I know the CMS paper made a note about this. I, I couldn't quite remember what that sentence was about. But there, there's often these um, parameters to do with the impact parameter and, and where you cut off. You, you know, we model these things as like hard spheres, yeah. but they're not really hard spheres. And I think that changes the photon flux slightly. Um, I think that that is what I can uh, say at this point. But I, I can look up that sentence in the CMS paper that made a comment about this. Okay. Yeah. This uh, Atlas affiliated authors actually. Uh, yes. We were waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the Vindel and company are Atlas affiliated authors. So okay, they are commuting. Right. Right. So just different modeling. Right. Yeah, they use different generators, right? So this one uses Starlight, and we use Magraph. Yeah, if you want to get into the details. Anybody else? If not, well, oh, yeah. so just a, a simple body question. So when you started looking at the very end, you showed a a very nice, uh, basically shower, uh, and of course those uh, don't require the Beam to be on. To what extent is is FHC sort of on when there is no beam? That's a great question. So this is a special uh, twelve-hour run that we did back in the summer of 2016, where we switched off the beam. But indeed, there are certain triggers that we installed where you can actually trigger in between when the, the beam's crossing. And um, yeah, I think there is still some, there can be still, you know, these beam halo things where you scrape little particles off the, the beam pipe that could be carried right, along. But, but something that's that orthogonal, you wouldn't get. Yes, yeah, so, but this one, there, the beam is actually switched off deliberately, but we left the detector running with standard detector running conditions for 12 hours to collect this data set. And in CMAS, we actually ran for three months after the beam was off because there was the idea that if something is trapped, inside the detector. It might decay three months so. later. And, <laughs> uh, you can see it. So there was a search. Uh, maybe you made an exotic particle in the collision. Very, very low. Right. Right. Maybe that's just the ionization yeah. where strong interaction stops it somewhere in the magnet or in the power meter, and then three months later it decays. So right. it would be very capable of probably lifetimes of a year or so. Yeah. Good. Uh, last chance for questions? If not, let's uh, thanks just say again. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I saw my next slide. Thank you. So now we have. Uh, Do we have time for. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have uh, about 45 minutes before okay. you leave. So Ulrich will show you the labs if he hasn't, right? Ulrich, yeah, I, right. I, I have my office hours end at 6, so I'll, I'll be there by 6 10 or 10. Okay, so, so 10 minutes and you'll get there. I'll get there okay, and so are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Do we have time to. Yeah, let's go. You want to take a breath maybe for a few minutes and then. Uh, I think I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It has been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost over.
Yeah. <sighs> 